Game on everybody! Rising Cup number 8 today and we are in the first round on Amazonia in the best of one series. And we have an undead versus a human on our hands. All the way up to the top right of Amazonia, Shadu starting here. And all the way down to the bottom left we have Death Note. Okay, so today we are actually going to go over a couple of the, well, basics of Warcraft 3. With Reforged coming up, there's obviously a lot of people that are interested in the RTS to at least an extent now. And especially for people that come from a different background, being it Heroes of the Storm, Starcraft 2 or whatnot. There's definitely a couple of elements in the game that might be a little bit confusing. And after the recent cast, someone... Actually, quite a few people asked me if I can't go over a few of the basic and basics and just like um, reiterate some of those. So I don't think we have to make it like too crazy, but obviously the uh, things that you should know at least is that we have in uh, Warcraft 3 four races that you can play. That alone makes obviously balancing also quite difficult. Uh, every StarCraft 2 fan already knows how difficult it can be to balance StarCraft 2 and balance discussions are in any RTS obviously always a huge deal. In this particular setup with four races, that's not the only thing that you have to consider when you play Warcraft 3. The other thing is that every race also has multiple heroes that they can play. There's even a couple of neutral heroes that you can access through the tavern on tavern maps. But those heroes then have also abilities like in any MOBA that you can upgrade as you progress and gain experience and rise in levels, even with an heroic ability or an ultimate on level 6. But those heroes can also carry a couple of items. So everybody that ever played, for example, Dota should be very familiar with this. I mean, Dota started as a mod out of Warcraft 3. And that's something that puts a lot more RNG into the game, of course, too. Because first of all, item drops that you can farm is one of the things where RNG is going to play a bit of a role and yeah it makes balancing even more tricky at this point just a bit of an acolyte trying to scout here obviously in any rts vision is key if you know what your opponent is doing you can prepare accordingly and that's what we're going to try or what we're going to see from uh, the boys here too so there's always neutral camps on the map you see those dots on uh, the mini map and they not only drop experience into the hands of the hero which you see right down here but you also get items and in this case the archmage picks up Claws of Attack plus 6. As a rule of thumb, as a ranged hero, you always like to have damage items because it helps you to put more and more pressure on the opponent. Oh, nice! Coil comes in and he actually doesn't deny it. Damn! That was a little bit sloppy from Death Knight, honestly. The Death Coil from the Death Knight was, well, in this case, used to take a peasant down, but previously he was aiming for the Water Elemental that was summoned by the Archmage here. So it was a bit of a hero fight. And interestingly enough, the coil was not quite enough to take the water elemental down. And what usually happens then is that the human player will try to take the water elemental down himself. And the reasoning behind this is that you try to deny experience to your opponent. So Warcraft 3 is a big battle about experience. And at the end of the game, if it's a long drawn out game, high level heroes will decide the fate of any player in the game. Especially when you're playing Undead, you rely on high-level heroes, you have direct damage spells like Coil and Nova, and you are trying to just take with those any kill that you can get against opponent against the opponent's sides. So you're trying to deny a lot of experience. Whereas in Warcraft, whereas in StarCraft 2, for example, you can just lose a couple of units. If you send a few units over to an expansion and you do damage there, but you lose all those units, that's not really necessarily a problem, depending on the trade that you get. But in Warcraft 3, it's a really different matter because every single unit that dies to another unit gives experience to the heroes around. And if there's no hero around, you still get the experience for here that's cross map and that's exactly why you have those deny attempts the entire time where you try to kill your own units when they're really low in this case nicely done archmage already on level three and we have the death knight still on level one that in and of itself is not really too crazy in this case we have death uh, we have shadow actually not trying to play anything crazy here where he's trying to just like farm or build himself an expansion he's just going for early aggression and with the plays that we're seeing from death note at this point he's setting up an expansion as you can already see so expansion plays are a little bit different if you're coming more from the starcraft 2 area then you'll pretty quickly figure out that there's a lot of one base play in warcraft 3 and there's also a lot of games in which you will just simply see one expansion being built and that's it if you compare that to starcraft 2 where the macro aspect of the rts is obviously very heavily focused on it's very very different 
The factor that is, on the other hand, quite strong in Warcraft 3 is micro. And it's a little bit of a different micro than what you see in Starcraft 2, where stutter stepping with marines and stims and stuff, or drops, for example, can be a big deal and very micro heavy. But generally speaking, every unit is worth a lot in Warcraft 3, so you just try and you move every single unit in and out of the battle. Try to not lose you any units whatsoever. You have also a lot less units to work with compared to StarCraft 2, so that's another big deal. The upkeep limit is 100 supply in this game. And that brings us actually to another factor of this. Now, first of all, as you might have already noticed, the town hall over here is already... Uh, so we have a town hall over here and one and the expansion. And this is the tier one place on, on the main building. Whereas over here, Shadu already has a hall of the dead. So he went from Necropolis, upgraded that. And once that you reach the next tier, that means that you get access to better units. You can uh, build a second hero, for example. And therefore, you already have at the beginning of the game a trade-off to be made. The undead players usually start with a one base and start to take very, very aggressively into uh, the Halls of the Dead and then also into the Black Citadel, which is tier 3 and allows them to employ a third hero, which is the limit. But the human player in this case, Death Note, has actually decided... Eh, there's the second hero, Lich is in. But the human player has actually decided that instead he wants to have the better economy. And of course that means that early on he needs to put the resources into building that town hall and also producing more units so that he can defend it. And therefore in his main base we still have him on tier 1. So the units that he can rely upon right now are not really all that useful compared to what the undead player is currently bringing into play. And what we're now seeing is already a tech into tier 3, and what the under is aiming for now is a destroyer push, so he's trying to just get as quickly as possible the best units that he can, and then execute a timing attack against the human player before that extra income that we're now seeing from Death Note has really come into play for the human player and allowed him to set up a defense that is strong enough to withstand all of this. And Death Note is now teching, as you can tell, into tier 2. So tier 2 will also allow him to get much better defenses out there, so it's a little bit of uh, play of time. Whereas Death Note would love nothing more than just delay the undead player a little bit, keep his heroes low, and for example, interrupt him while the undead player is creeping and taking those uh, those creep camps that we see on the map to get some extra experience for himself. He would love to just delay the entire process so that the undead hero, uh, the undead player, can't really hit that timing. Outside of that, there's another aspect that we need to talk about, and that is actually the upkeep. So up to the top right, you see currently the, uh, the upkeep right here. And in this case, we have 39 out of 50 maximum supply. As I already said previously, 100 is the absolute maximum that you can reach. But there's another mechanic that kicks in with Warcraft 3 that StarCraft 2, for example, doesn't have. And that is that once you, cr you get over into uh, 50 supply, once you get above 50, you have to pay a tax. You have too many units and that means you have to pay a tax and that tax is paid in gold. So all of a sudden, instead of getting 10 out of every single unit that walks over, 10 gold out of every single one of those workers moving in, you only get seven. So it's a pretty hefty tax already, but if you're looking at a late game and you already have an expansion, then of course you have no problem paying that. And once you crush, uh, you go over 70, then you have to pay even more and you only get four out of every worker that delivers gold to you. So that makes it very attractive for players to stay at 50 supply for as long as they possibly can. And it's one of the reasons why you will oftentimes see, let's say, an under player, for example, hoard immense amounts of gold and also lumber at 50 supply, build a couple of additional production structures, and then when he tries to attack, pump massively out of those structures and get rid of all those resources. So in this case, Shado is currently at 45 supply, and when you look over to Death Note, he's sitting at 42. And Death Note is very, very likely going to be the one to cross over into the low upkeep first, aka above 50 supply. Um, and that's what he's most likely going to do pretty soon, because even if he has to play that, pay that tax, he's still getting way more resources than his under opponent because of that expansion. Now he's also tacking immediately from tier 2, the keep into castle tier 3, but now that he has tier 2, he can build a second hero, and that's the Mountain King. As you can also tell, he has started to build way more turrets in his main base, and he's also just turtling up at this expansion, trying to do the exact same thing. On that player, on the other hand, he has a third hero now, also on his side, so the Dark Ranger is in. 
And as I said previously, every single hero has multiple abilities that can be used, and in total three, and an heroic ability on level six. And as you rise in levels, you can upgrade those periodically. So for example, a death knight that skills a death coil on level one can upgrade death coil on level two on level three, and can upgrade it to level three on hero level five. And that's where it does the most damage. So for an undead player, that is normally the focus. You're trying to uh, going heavily on the damage output with your Nova and with your Death Coil, and you're pressuring the opponent's hero during those fights. Whereas an Archmage has, of course, then uh, tools like Water Elementals and his Brilliance Aura. And there's the attack, and this is exactly what I talked about earlier. Currently, Death Lord is trying to buy himself a little bit more time. What better thing to do than attack your opponent's base and force them to react? If Shadow doesn't do anything here, he's going to lose a lot of units in the main base, and he's going to lose that economy and those acolytes. So he has to defend that. What does that do for Death Note? Well, he's going to lose a couple of footmen, but he can easily make that happen. The problem is he also loses the Mountain King. Now, thankfully for him, that MK was only on level 1, so it's not really a big deal. But it also means that the level 1 Mountain King now has to be revived at the altar and won't be able to get any experience during that time. And he has a level 4 Archmage, which is nice, but the problem is that we're already looking at Lich on level 2, we're looking at a Death Knight on level 3, so he already has the level 2 coil, and he's starting to creep even more. And by the time that the Mountain King is back and can finally start to gather experience for level 2, the Undead forces are going to be already much, much stronger, and it's going to be tough for the Mountain King to really get to a level where he can be useful for Death Note. But what Death Note definitely did accomplish in the last attack, he bought himself a little bit more time. So now he get, can get more resources. You can already tell he's at 1,800 gold right now. He's still below 50 supply, so that's why he gets the full resources that he's currently mining out of those gold mines. But at some point, he is aggressively going to push this. Whereas Shadow is already at 58 supply. So Shadow has actually started to change his gameplay a little bit. He has decided that he doesn't want to go for the timing attack anymore, but instead he builds an expansion himself. And that's one of the reasons why he's willing to go into 58 supply and is still continuing continuing to creep, so he's playing it a little bit more over the experience that his heroes have. Now every single hero, now that we talked about them, has also an inventory, and you probably picked up on that already, if you're not really a huge Warcraft fan just yet, but in the inventory of the Death Knight, we for example have currently also Town Portal, we have Rune Braces, so that's making it a bit more e a bit easier for the Death Knight to just survive any kind of pressure from the Mountain King when he starts to use the Stormbolt. Especially if you're like familiar with the Blizzard universe and Warcraft in general, but even Heroes of the Storm, you should actually recognize a lot of the heroes pretty quickly, or at least the abilities that are being used there. Granite Golem's on level 9 as a huge creep, gives a lot of experience and also great items. And since map control currently goes to Shadow, since he has the bigger army and the better heroes, he can easily go for that. And he finds the Legion Dumont, which is absolutely shit because his hero already has that aura so that's definitely the item that you don't want to get nothing that's really going to be pretty nice for him uh but again at the same time now the human player is as i already mentioned previously you know trying to of course level his mountain king and there comes a mechanic you see that the archmage is actually far off to the left side and the mountain king is alone as he goes for those creeps and that's together with the paladin who was added third but the reason is that if the if one hero is close to the creeps that are being taken down and another one is far away only the close hero will actually get the experience and he's currently trying to so to say power level those low level heroes and he has to because at this point Shadow has just the better setup when it comes to heroes but when we're looking at, uh, at the units and uh, the army size then obviously it's a different story we have Death Note at 75 already and Shadow is only at 57 now as an undead you're normally in the spot where you can do a lot with your heroes themselves the Lich for example firing away with the Orb of Corruption here and getting even more damage in now so those, those heroes are incredibly powerful but it's still a little bit of a problem that the human army is this big, especially since we're talking about upgrades with two two upgrades, two attack upgrades, two armor upgrades on those knights, and they are just absolutely murdering here. If you compare that to the Abomination, which is the tier 3 melee unit of undeads, then uh, that thing has no upgrades whatsoever, ever, and Shadow also has only a single attack upgrade on those fiends. Shadow is already dropping down to 49 supply, which of course has now also the added at least uh, positive effect that he doesn't have to pay any upkeep anymore but the lich is in trouble and might actually die and indeed goes down nice hero kill here 
from uh, Death Note and the GG gets thrown out as the Undead realizes he doesn't have a chance anymore to win the game. Just lost everything he had here, his heroes too, and he just can't overpower Death Note anymore. GG! And the human player advances to the next round of the Rising Cup. Game number two in the Rising Cup. And, well, currently we're looking uh, on Twisted Meadows. Not quite sure what exactly they're talking about, but the game map was rehosted, so maybe that's what he meant with misclick. We have uh, Poopy, which we call from now on Puppy, on the top left, because he looks so cute. And cross position to the bottom of the map, his Night Elf opponent, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so immediately we're having a little bit of German banter coming through here. But as I already did in the last game, we actually need to talk a little bit about just some of the uh, just some of the basics of Warcraft 3. And again, I'm going to use the early games now to do exactly that. So we did that in the first round already. This is also, I think, around one match. So let's go over this just slightly. Once again, for people that just tuned in and they're not all that familiar with Warcraft 3 just yet. And of course, those videos are going to be uploaded to YouTube too, so that they can check it out. But what we already did in the last game, we talked a little bit about just upkeeps, which we will probably address here once more. But the key factor in an RTS for Warcraft 3 is really that you have heroes that you can use. So on the side of our Night Elf player, we already see the Keeper of the Grove being built. And the hero choice is incredibly important when you play Warcraft 3 because depending on what hero you choose to start with, uh, also which hero you try to go in as a second hero and a third hero, which you do not have to add, that really changes the entire way that you play the game. Are you choosing, for example, a hero that makes it easier for you to harass your opponent? Or are you more looking at a hero that will make it easier for you in the early game to, let's say, creep some uh, heavier camps? We talked a lot about the creep camps on the map, but you probably already figured out that there are some creep camps that are just more difficult to attack than others. And if you have a level 1 hero and you go up to a granite golem on level 9, that granite golem is going to spank your ass so quickly that you won't know what hit you. So normally at the beginning of the game, if you are trying to level your hero, you're focusing a little bit more as smaller camps like this one over here, for example, uh, which unfortunately because of the fog of war we couldn't see just yet, but we will be able to see that in just a few seconds. And you can see that on the minimap. So on the minimap, the different circles that you see there obviously indicate different strength camps. This one, orange, we have red camps and we have green ones. But as you can imagine, if you, for example, want to go into a setup that allows you to creep early on, already a little bit of harass, by the way, here by the Keeper and the Blade Master has already crept one camp, has a little bit more experience than uh, the Night Elf's first hero. But the Blade Master traditionally is more hero that really allows you to also be a bit more aggressive at the beginning. But if you're trying to creep, if you're saying, okay, my entire strategy is more so designed to try and get uh, a higher hero level a little bit quicker, I want my hero on level 2, I want to have an early level 3 because it really matters to me, then it can be that, for example, the summoning hero is the weapon of choice. Now, the Keeper is in the lucky position where you can actually decide a little bit more flexibly on what exactly you want to do with him. So you have, on the one hand, Force of Nature, which summon Treans, that you can use to creep um, stronger camps early on, compared to other races or other hero openings. But you can also go into Entangle, which we've already seen, which locks the unit down, and then you can attack it and do a bit more damage there. So there's a couple of different approaches. But hence the question always, what is your first hero going to be? Now for some races, that question is answered pretty quickly. As an undead player outside of the mirror match, you will see the huge majority of undeads always start with a death knight because a death knight is just incredibly useful early on. A death coil cannot only do damage to the opponent's units, but also heal your own. We have some undead players that will instead open with a dreadlord, for example, if they want to go into an earlier expansion. As especially in mirror matches, the idea 
here to open up with Lich against your opponents. There's a few variations, but 90% of the undead players that you see will start with the Death Knight and then add Lich as a second hero because the Lich supplies you with even more direct damage. But when it comes to other races, it's always a question of how many heroes do you actually want to play because there's only a limited amount of experience available. Every single unit that you kill has a specific amount of experience that it grants to you and that experience gets split amongst the heroes that you have. So if you play with a single hero, that single hero will be level, will le level much quicker than if you have three heroes and the experience gets distributed between all three of them. So that's an important factor of that. Especially in the old days, but even on the amateur level, today still there's also some strategies where you play a single hero because all that you're trying to do is you try to rush to your heroic ability, to your ultimate, and then dominate the opponent with that. Dreadlord, for example, that is being played as a solo hero for a long time is a very good example because once you have level 6 you get an infernal and that thing just is absolutely murderous but not something that you see necessarily every day on the on the top level of play but if you play yourself and you just start up that might be something to consider here in this game right now, we still have uh, both players only uh, rocking a single hero. There's a Hunt's opening now for Kevin, which means that he's going to invest into a lot of tier 1 units here. So probably has in the main base a double Ancient of War. Uh, Blade Master's already a bit of in trouble, but able to rush out. Boots of Speed now in inventory. Highly important item in Warcraft 3 in general. You also have a day and night cycle that for most races doesn't really matter all that much, but we have some items that affect it and also Night Elf in particular have a lot of units that can actually shadow melt, meaning at night they can become invisible if they stand absolutely still and don't do anything here. So that can be a huge deal too. And that's where, for example, the Dust of Appearance comes into play, which detects invisible units. It also works against the Blade Master, who has a few tools. As expected, by the way, over here we have the Tree of Life, so still tier 1 for him and is already starting to also buy himself a couple of units here. There's some neutral units that you can actually grab, so most of those uh, creeps, they protect, for example, things like a mercenary camp, where you can also hire a couple of mercenaries. There's shops on the maps where you can buy items, so items can only be found by taking mercenary, uh, sorry, creeps down, but you can also get, grab them like this. And there are a couple of really useful tools that you have when you have access to a mercenary camp. The Forest Scroll Shadow Priest, for example, is really useful if you have a keeper against you because he has a dispel that you can use against the entangle but also against any kind of summoning units it's pretty a powerful tool to have in your arsenal in this case the tavern might actually be useful for a second he double checked so in the tavern you, which is usually centered in the middle of the map you can get a neutral hero instead of just building a second one that is race specific in your own altar there's the second hero for uh, the orc player though we have the shadow hunter the one thing that I can already tell you about that little fella is you, uh, of den muss man always uh, but Wisps are coming in too, so uh, quick their donate to uh, take some of the mana away from the Shadow Hunter here. But already we have the level 3 for the Keeper, and in the inventory he has a potion of greater mana, uses it immediately. Nice tool to put more pressure onto the Blade Master, and he's already in a world of trouble. But thanks to the boots of speed, he gets away. The problem is that it doesn't really look like the Shadow Hunter has a chance here. Catapults are now being built too. One of the reasons why we see them is because they do extra damage to hunts. There's the kill set up against the Keeper, but the Blade Master dies first. And the Keeper plays it safe. Moves out. Does he get the second hero? And the answer is no. Oh, well, actually, he might. Hunt goes down. Yep, the Blade Master got bought at the tavern. So you can either rebuild a dead hero in your own altar. Or, which takes time and of course resources, or you can buy him at a higher price at the tavern and have immediate access to him, but he doesn't spawn with full mana and HP as you probably already noted. In this setup, the uh, demolishers, the catapults, as I already started to point out, they do siege damage. And siege damage is part of the mechanic of how damage works in Warcraft 3, because every single unit has a damage type and an armor type. And those do sometimes extra damage. So, for example, siege damage or piercing damage does extra damage to unarmored units, as you can see right here. And that's one of the reasons why that Shadow Hunter also has as level 1 the Serpent Wards, because those do piercing damage. The demolishers do siege 
huge damage, so you can already tell it's a lot of extra damage against those hunts. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to win the fight, but it's definitely going to help you a lot to lock those down. And as you already see, Kevin is losing one hundreds after another here. He's trying his best to take especially the demolishers down as quickly as he can, but there's also a few peons involved now that can heal them or repair them very, very quickly. And can, if need be, also be used to drop a couple of towers in the, at the opponent's base. So we have a very aggressive game early on. Ancient Protect has now even been built, two of those, because Kevin and Puppy are trying somehow to uh, end that game early by just going straight up for some heavy aggression at the opponent's base. And you might have already noticed this is not necessarily the top level of Warcraft 3 just yet. We're still in the super early round here. Not to say that those guys are bad, but if you compare them to Happy and some of the other ca uh, the games um, players that we casted, then they're definitely not quite on the, the same skill level. But it's a really good uh, game to actually explain some of those mechanics that I've been talking about earlier. So now with those aggressive towers that are being built by uh, Poppy here, he can start to really execute a bit more pressure onto his opponent. We have level 3 on the Keeper, but as I explained earlier, he's playing that solo. He's able to get the kill against the Blade Master, and he's level 4 now. If he can get a kill, another kill against the Shadow Hunter, that would be great. But in terms of experience, he's starting to fall behind a little bit. But that kill is going to be worth a lot for him. So now the Keeper on 4.5. We have a couple of ranged units also for the Orc player, who now decided to go into Trollhead Hunters to add some additional piercing damage against the potential Hunter strategy. Towers are getting attacked too, and with the Shadow Hunter and the Blade Master down, there's nothing left for the Orc player that can really dish out damage. At the same time now, the Ancient of War is walking over to take some of those Watchtowers down and get a few of those hits in. The Grunt that is currently trying to attack down here is not doing a whole lot either. There's of course a couple of race specific things that we haven't really touched upon just yet but you might have picked up a few. There are uh, up, uh, the production buildings or most of the production buildings of a night elf for example can be rooted out of the ground, walk a little bit, they change their armor type while they do that and actually attack as well. Uh, also moon wells exist and when those moon wells are full of energy they can heal night elf units and also restore their mana. At the same time uh, that's something uh, that can also become a problem because during daytime those moon wells don't regenerate, they only regenerate at night. But as it already happens, Puppy is going to lose that tower now too. At least one of his heroes is back and that's the Blade Master. And yep, here comes the self kill that we talked about previously. So he's trying to deny extra experience to his opponent's hero. And talking a little bit about experience just in general, I mentioned earlier that you get more experience on a single hero than if you have, let's say, uh, multiple heroes around because the experience get distributed. That obviously is also a little bit affected by how close you are to the units that gets taken down. I mentioned that in our first game uh, a little bit. But another thing is also that the amount of experience is hinging or the extra exp you get extra experience if you actually are on tier 2 or tier 3. So that's also kind of important. And in this case we have only tier 1 units. We have Kevin now trying to expand as well and give himself another Players source of income over here yeah. at the gold mine. The Orc player has also started to change his MO a little bit. The early aggression that we've seen from him hasn't really worked out as he expected, so now instead he's trying to at least creep a bit. Because the cool thing about creeping is it doesn't only give you items and experience, but at the same time it also gives you gold, so you get additional resources. If you actually creep the entire map and your opponent doesn't get as many of those camps, then you will end up in a situation where you have a lot more resources than your opponent does. Blade Master now with the crits is just chasing those archers down. Nice buddy block! here with the hunt. Well done, especially against the boots on the Blade Master. He's gonna get this eventually, but the rest of the fight is currently centered around those grunts at the top and with all those entangles that are getting dropped by the level 4. Nearly level 5 keeper, that's going to hurt quite a bit. We also have the Shadow Hunter on level 3 now, which in this case means that he has his healing wave on level 2. But once he has certain wards on level 2 later on as well, those hunts are not going to do a whole lot anymore because that piercing damage uh, that the summons are dropping is going to be heavily increased too. We have a few upgrades already in the play here, so at this point plus one attack upgrades for the hunts. 
and down to the bottom of the map the tree of life is already in position we still don't see oh actually we have just now attack into the tree of life started so he wants to get into tier two whereas the orc player has of course been there for quite some time that's also why he can build that second hero one of the main reasons why we'd only see one single night elf hero is actually that he just can't build a second one that's what he needs the tree of ages for aka his tier two structure Level 5 has another interesting part as well, because level 5 means that if he creeps a campsite, uh, any kind of creep camp on the map, he doesn't get experience for this anymore with this hero. You cannot creep a hero to level 6. 5 is the absolute maximum. After that, the experience that you gain is only gained by taking down units from your opponent. So as you can see right now, once that he takes this one down, nothing is going to change over here for the Keeper. Keeper doesn't get any additional experience, and one of the reasons is that, well, pretty much in Warcraft 3, it's prevented that you can just creep yourself to level 6. So uh, at level 5, there is just no... There are very, there are very few reasons to not add another hero, especially if there are still creep camps on the map that you could possibly take to add another one. So the Keeper is already as powerful as he's going to get from creep camps alone. Obviously a lot of the experience that he got to this point were also by taking down Orc units. But he needs to really look into those fights now. Whereas the Blade Master is nearly on level 4, the Shadow Hunter is on level 3. So with level ups come stats advantages, especially on the hit points. But more importantly, of course, those abilities can be upgraded. And that's why this Entangle, which is now on level 3, is now hurting a lot more. And they're already trying to make the play right there. Another snipe attempt for the Shadow Hunter with those Hunts. He's trying to surround him as quickly as he can. We have a couple of Shamans now in play too. So they can go for Purge, which locks the Keeper down. He has no portal in the inventory. And that is a huge problem. If he had any chance of locking him down a little bit more, that would be a kill. There's no Town Portal. Oh! He let the Shadow Hunter get another hit through. And that's a level 5 hero that has just fallen. That's a huge chunk of experience that now ended up in the hands of the Orc player. Who's now at 39 supply against the 28 that we have for Kevin. And down to the bottom of the map. He's obviously trying to set this base up. If that base is never scouted by Puppy, that would be pretty fantastic. Because then he could still try to play the economy card here. As you can tell in the top gold mine of the Orc player, there's only 3,000 gold left. And so far he hasn't scouted that out. But obviously he's going to double check just to be safe. And he's going to find very quickly that there is indeed a second base produced by his Night Elf opponent. And with that, he's easily going to go down there. So at this point, the GG is already called. As Kevin sees, okay, I lost my hero. I have no chance to recover from this. He found my expansion too. He's going to destroy it. I don't have the units to really deal with that. And therefore, the game is lost to me. So he goes for the fair play move, types GG, and leaves the game.